Section 18 of The Mystery of the Ocean Star This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Mystery of the Ocean Star by W. Clark Russell Section 18 The Old Naval Sea Song there are two kinds of sea songs, those which are sung at concerts and in drawing rooms, and sometimes, but not very often at sea, and those which are never heard off shipboard. The latter have obtained, in this age, the name of shanty, a term which I do not recollect ever having heard when I was following the life. It is obviously manufactured out of the French verb and there is a longshore twang about it which cannot sound very relishably upon the elderly nautical ear. This sort of song is designed to lighten and assist the sailor's toil. It is an air that enables a number of men pulling upon a rope to regulate their combined exertions. It is also a song for sailors to sing as they tramp round a capstan and heave upon a windlass. Of the melodies of many of them, it is difficult to trace the paternity. Some are so engaging that they might well be regarded as the compositions of musicians of genius, who wrote them with little suspicion of the final uses to which they would be put. Why their destination, having been sung perhaps at the harpsichord and the guitar by ladies and gentlemen, should be the foxhole, why being appropriated by the sailor they should be so peculiarly his that no one else ever dreams of singing them there is no use in attempting to guess the reader will not require me to tell him that the marine working songs are to be heard only in the merchant service in a ship of war the uproar caused by the hoarse bawling of half a dozen gangs of men scattered about the decks would be intolerable nor could the working song be of service to the blue jacket, who is quite numerous enough to manage without it. It was always so, indeed. A frigate getting under way would flash into canvas in a breath. Sails were sheeted home, yards hoisted, jibs and staysails run up, and the anchor tripped as though the complicated mechanism were influenced by a single controlling power producing simultaneously a hundred different effects there were men enough to do everything and all at once but the ship's company of the merchantman was always too few for her a mercantile sailor is expected to do the work of two and at a pinch of three and even four when one job is done he has to spring to another there are stations indeed in such manoeuvres as tacking or wearing but when for instance it comes to shortening sail in a hurry or when the necessity arises for a sudden call for all hands the merchant sailor lays hold of the first rope it is necessary to drag on and when he has belayed it he is expected to fling himself upon the next rope that has to be pulled here we have the secret of the usefulness of the working song let the words be what they will the melody animates the seaman with spirit and he pulls with a will it helps him to keep time too so that not so much as an ounce of the united weight of the hauling and bawling fellows misses of its use on the tackle they drag at i have known seamen at work on some job that required a deal of heavy and sustained pulling to labour as if all heart had gone out of them whilst one of the gang tried song after song, the mate meanwhile standing by and encouraging them with the familiar official rhetoric, till on a sudden air has been struck up that acted as if by magic. The men not only found their own strength, every fellow became as good as two. This, I believe, will be the experience of most merchant sailors. There are tunes to fit every kind of work on board ship, short, cheerful melodies for jobs soon accomplished, or over which a captain would not allow time to be wasted in singing, 
for I am bound to say that the disposition of a sailor is to make a very great deal of song go into the smallest possible amount of pull, such as hauling out a bowline, mastheading one of the lighter yards, or boarding a tack. Other working choruses, again, are as long as a ship's cable. These are sung at the capstan or at the windlass. When the intervals between the starting of the solo and the coming in of the chorus do not hinder the work an instant. It would be interesting to know when and by whom the working song was first introduced into the British merchant service. In old books of voyages, no reference whatever is made to it. There is not a sentence in the collections, from Hackloyt down to Burney, to indicate that when the early sailors pushed at handspikes or dragged upon the rigging, they animated their labours with songs and choruses. I have some acquaintance with the volumes of Shelvock, Funnel, and other marine writers of the last century, but though many of them, such as Ringrose, Dampier, Cook, Snellgrave, and particularly Woods Rogers, enter very closely into the details of the shipboard work of their time, they are to a man silent on this question of singing. It is for this reason that I would attribute the origin of the practice to the Americans. If most of the foxhall melodies still current at sea be not the composition of Yankees, the words, at all events, are sufficiently tinctured by American sentiment to render my conjecture plausible. The titles of many of these working songs have a strong flavour of Boston and New York about them. Across the Western Ocean, the Plains of Mexico, Run, Let the Bull Gine Run, Bound to the Rio Grande, these and many more which I cannot immediately recollect, betray to my mind a transatlantic inspiration. Heave to the girls, cheerly men, a dandy ship and a dandy crew, tally hi ho you know hurrah hurrah my hearty bullies and scores more of a like kind all of them working songs never to be heard off the decks of a ship are racy in air and words of the soil of the states the other kind of songs the songs of charles and thomas dibden shield arnold henry russell arne boyce etc are of a very different order. The working song is often at best but little more than an unintelligible doggerel. It is the sailor's trick to improvise as he goes along, and rhyme and reason are entirely subordinate to the obligation of shouting out something. But the sea song, as landsmen understand the term, is accepted as a composition of meaning and even of poetry. At long intervals it is so. There is no lyric in the English language comparable to Ye Mariners of England and The Battle of the Baltic. Cease, rude Boreas, again commonly attributed to George Alexander Stevens, though I believe it was written by William Falconer. The author of The Shipwreck is a fine stirring poem, full of sailors' weather and salt spray, and the thunder of the gale. But the average British sea song, whether old or new, ranks low as a sample of poetry. Dibden is happiest when he is least technical. There is a pathos in Tom Bowling that needs not the accentuation of its exquisite air to appeal to us. But when he is particularly nautical, every sailor will, I think, admit that he is very much at sea indeed. One reason why the landsman's nautical song finds but little favour among mariners is, I think, because he is seldom successful in catching the true maritime spirit and flavour. It is idle to write about wet sheets and flowing seas unless you know what they mean. A man must serve a long apprenticeship to the ocean to master the shades and significations of the nomenclature of the marine, 
and he must serve for a longer period yet to gather the import of the subtle professional intellectual conditions which go to the creation of the sea mind the employment of marine technicalities by a poet to whom they are unintelligible may result in what looks like a sea song but no true sailor will ever care to sing it nor will the bard find himself better recommended to the seaman by references to what even in this age is accepted as the traditional character of the tar another reason why jack does not take kindly to the landsman's sea songs is perhaps he gets so much of the ocean in fact that he wants no more of it in fiction a true thing he will relish and sing and talk of no matter how deep in the heart of the country it was produced nor how pastoral the genius of its author but he turns wearily from descriptions of gallant ships and rustling sails of dripping prows and boatswain's calls of carousels on shore of sweethearts and wives of billy crosstree and tommy marlinspike my own experience is that sailors when they get a chance to sing at sea choose the current sentimental ditties of the theatre and the music hall i dare say that two lovely black eyes is sung now on the ocean by men who never heard of tom tuff or all in the downs darna's old seaman of eighteen thirty four was true of my time twenty years ago and doubtless he would stand as a type of scores of mariners yet living i never shall forget he says hearing an old salt who had broken his voice by hard drinking on shore and bellowing from the masthead in a hundred northwesters singing with all manner of ungovernable trills and quavers in the high notes breaking into a rough falsetto and in the low ones growling along like the dying away of the boatswain's all hands ahoy down the hatchway oh no we never mention him perhaps like me he struggles with each feeling of regret but if he is loved as i have loved he never can forget the last line he roared out at the top of his voice breaking each word into half a dozen syllables this was very popular and jack was called on every night to give them his sentimental song no one called for it more loudly than i for the complete absurdity of the execution and the sailor's perfect satisfaction in it were ludicrous beyond measure when i went to sea as a little midshipman having some small ear for music though i did not then and still do not know my notes i took with me a sort of accordion that had keys like a pianoforte and this i would carry on to the forecastle on a fine quiet evening and play to the men and accompany them in their singing and i took notice that the songs they liked best indeed they cared for no others were of the strictly sentimental kind such as ever of thee here's a fair good night to thee love i'd be a butterfly and so on we may take it i think that the decline of the popularity at sea of the dibdin school of song is due to the long peace which this country has enjoyed or at all events to the long intervals which have elapsed between naval engagements since waterloo prior to that decisive action the country was almost incessantly at war our home waters were covered with british cruisers and reports of single and general actions were arriving weekly i had almost said daily from half the oceans of the globe the pig-tailed mariner was a great hero then the inclodons and brahams were warbling his praises in very pretty music much was made of his saucy frigate of the towering liner and the little ten-gun pelter of hawk and howe and keppel and much too of mounseer's cowardice but when those war times came to an end there was little left in the shape of maritime marvels for the contemporary bard to express in verse algiers navarino and so down to the crimea 
were too brief for inspiration the traditional feats grew obscure in the haze of time and jack got tired of the old rollicking celebrations steam and iron confirmed the indifference induced by spells of inactivity further the old portraits ceased to resemble the modern sailor the pigtail had been hove overboard wooden legs were no longer plentiful coffee and cocoa were replacing the can of grog outside the old machinery of moonlight and shivering topsails there was nothing definite to write about indeed long before the crimean war jack had revolted against all attempts to represent him as a lion-hearted man with a face discoloured by grog pimples a hat jauntily fixed upon nine hairs and feet squeezed into little dancing pumps and since he could not procure anything written about himself that was worth singing he addressed his mind to ditties in which no reference whatever was made to his calling but throughout the last century and during the first fifteen or twenty years of this the sea song was popular in proportion as the words were good and the music brisk with our fighting crews and the old wooden fabrics resounded the thunder of lungs of hurricane power roaring out choruses glorifying britannia's might and the heroism of the hardy salts the creation of this type of ocean ballad is intimately associated with the honoured name of charles dibden but there were other writers before him the originators of a school of which he is the most illustrious example whose compositions there is every reason to believe proved as heartening and as animating in their day as ever did the best of poor tom bowling's in his it is a literature hard to get at only the very choicest specimens have been suffered to survive in the existing collections nearly all the sea songs included in the lists i have examined are by dibdin or his contemporaries some excellent examples such as all's well the snug little island when vulcan forged the bolts of jove were the productions of dibdin's son i doubt not there are many nautical ballads of the seventeenth and eighteenth centuries to be met with by any one with sufficient leisure and diligence to engage in such a search a collection of the kind would usefully supplement our naval histories and prove a work of enduring interest to the country at large and more particularly to the british marine there is indeed something peculiarly engaging in the nautical lyric in which a contemporaneous hand has celebrated the mighty deeds of the bold admiral or captain of a hundred or two hundred years ago it is a sort of rough verse to transform the past into an arras the imagination quickens the figures and the whole tapestry glows into life upon the vision of the mind the old ship rises before us straining at her hempen cables or rolling and plunging to the gale under canvas the fashion of whose cut is as dead and gone as the names by which they were known you see her castellated stern her black or yellow sides bristling with guns under the deep waist and the many quaintnesses of her apparel of sails and streamers the admiral with a face like the north-west moon clad in the attire of the sea brave of the stuarts or of the first george stumps the poop royal with a prospective glass under his arm watching the chase ahead a squadron of flying frenchmen or dutchmen or spaniards occasionally sending a glance over the quarter where his consorts of the union jack are frothing and rolling along in a huddle of dingy canvas i never read the song called admiral benbow without the vision rising before me of the whole of that sea-dog's stern and melancholy business with ducasse there is not a line of description in it of the kind i mean to help the imagination nevertheless the verse has a magic of its own every sentence conjures up a radiant canvas 
Admiral Benbow. Come all ye sailors bold, lend an ear, lend an ear. Come all ye sailors bold, lend an ear. It's of our Admiral's fame, brave Benbow called by name, How he fought upon the main, you shall hear, you shall hear. Brave Benbow he set sail, for to fight, for to fight. Brave Benbow he set sail, for to fight. Brave Benbow he set sail with a fine and pleasant gale, but his captains they turned tail in a fright, in a fright. Says Kirby unto Hood, I will run, I will run. Says Kirby unto Hood, I will run. I value not disgrace, nor the losing of my place. My enemies I'll not face, with a gun, with a gun. T'was the ruby and Noah's ark, taught the French, taught the French. T'was the ruby and Noah's ark, taught the French. And there was ten in all, poor souls, they fought them all, they valued them not at all, nor their noise, nor their noise. Unfortunate it was, by chain shot, by chain shot, unfortunate it was, by chain shot. Our admiral lost his legs, unto his men he begs, By Tom, brave boys, he says, tis my lot, tis my lot. There is a true ocean swing in this rhythm. Over many a steaming bowl, by the light of many an oscillating slush lamp, and to the wagging of more pigtails than I should like to count, have these stirring verses been roared out. Poor Benbow loses his legs. Tis my lot, tis my lot, he says, and the poet proceeds. While the surgeon dressed his wound, how he cried, how he cried. While the surgeon dressed his wound, how he cried. Let my cradle now in haste on the quarter deck be placed, that my enemies I may face till I'm dead till i'm dead and there brave benbow lay crying out crying out and there brave benbow lay crying out boys let us tack about once more we'll drive them to their shore we value not half a score nor their noise nor their noise Benbow was one of those seamen about whom the English sailor of his and of succeeding days could never weary of singing. Sir, wrote Ducasse to him, I had little hopes, on Monday last, but to have supped in your cabin. But it pleased God to order it otherwise. I am thankful for it. As for those cowardly captains who deserted you, hang them up, for, by, they deserve it. The old Jacks used to sing another fine song about him. Oh, we sailed to Virginia, and from thence to fire all. Oh, we watered our shipping, and so we weighed all. Being in view of the sea, boys, seven sail we did espy. Oh, we hoisted our topsails, and sailed speedily. The recurrent O oh, in the seven verses which form the song is what Tom Kringle would call exceedingly fine. It expresses the prefatory howl with which Jack delights to regale his hearers before plunging into the substance of the music and the verse. Oh, we drew up our squadron in a very nice line, and we fought them courageously for near four hours' time. But the day being spent and the night coming on, oh, we let them alone until the next morn. The poet's enthusiasm, however, hurries him into a little blunder. Oh, the very next morning by the break of the day, Oh, we hoisted our topsails, and so we bore away. We bore down to Port Royal, where the people flocked much, 
to see brave admiral benbow carry to kingston town church from this it might be inferred that the admiral died at sea and was buried at port royal the truth being that he lived nearly a month after the arrival of his ship at jamaica sometimes but not very often the old sea-song writer was sarcastic the school of dibdin was full of enthusiasm everything english is above praise everything french beneath contempt marryat whose sea lyrics all admirable of their kind though they have the uncommon fault of being too few hinted to the country in swinging verse that it was not impossible for a british naval captain to be neither a hero nor a gentleman but then to be sure marryat wrote in comparatively peaceful times when the perpetuation of the drunken swaggering roaring patriotism of the dibdinite mariner could serve no immediate end there were poets however long previous to marryat much earlier indeed than dibdin who could forget their warlike enthusiasm sufficiently to tell a saucy truth in a frisky stanza or two in a word they could find stomach enough for the assumption of a satirical countenance here is a stroke in this way and few songs of the kind were ever more heartily sung bold benjamin captain edwards is gone to sea hi sir ho sir with a jovial ship's company on board the bold benjamin o he carried out five hundred men hi sir ho sir and brought home but thirty-one on board the bold benjamin o when they came to blackwall hi sir ho sir men women and children all aloud did they call here comes the bold benjamin o there was mothers weeping for their sons hi sir ho sir widows for loss of husbands on board the bold benjamin o a song about admiral bing is less covert the poet could plead justification and wrote as if he knew that he had the world with him it would seem that this amiable composition was published whilst bing was awaiting his trial i have only space to quote the last verse for behaving so well on the ocean at least he deserves a string and if he should sue for promotion i hope they will give him his swing 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 o oh rare admiral bing this song seems to have been a bid for the popularity of the tavern rather than for that of the forecastle. there is no flavour of the sea in it moreover it is not probable that the sailor would take very kindly to a ditty that represented his flag as disgraced it is the custom to speak of dibdin as the originator of the heave-ho rum-coloured grog-soaked lively hearty who on stepping ashore from his frigate which has just arrived with a rich prize in tow instantly flies to nancy and the bowl to those who have not carried their inquiries in this direction further than dibdin there is indeed quite enough of drink and of grinning through horse collars in his compositions to justify the notion that the jovial reeling salt found his earliest metrical and melodious interpretation in the works of his composer the drink to be discovered in dibdin's songs would make a sea large enough for several combined fleets of that age to have floated on the sailor had nothing to do but to sing in all weathers beat the french and drink the swizzy inspired by the wishes of mr pitt it was dibdin's business to paint the sea life in captivating colours his properties were not numerous lovely sue the jorum of grog pockets full of prize money the fiddle the song and the dance the machinery of allurement scarcely went farther 
These temptations, it is quite possible, conveyed in plain verse and vehicled by many pleasing tunes, were useful auxiliaries to the labours of the press gang, but they also helped to confirm many odd notions of the sailor's character which had long been floating loose on the surface of public opinion. In reality, Dibden merely helped onwards some old queer prejudices and superstitions. The Pipeses and Hatchways and Trunnions not only drank as heavily as the whopping heroes of Dibden's muse, they were out and away their superiors as artists in bad language. In truth, if we are to believe the old novelists and the playwrights from Beaumont and Fletcher down to John O'Keefe, the men who fought and bled for this country at sea, and who hoisted her as a nation to the world's masthead, were the most hardened race of ruffians, bullies, swearers, and drunkards that ever hiccuped out blasphemies under the stars. This is the character of the noble fellows who fought under Hawkins, Shovel, Hawke, Rodney, Nelson, Collingwood, as we find it in the old sea song, were even the traditions half true, there would have been but little done by our sailors for Dibden and the other songwriters to sing about. Here is a stanza embodying the wishes of a tarpaulin of the reign of George the Second. Let there be sailors to carry me, let them be dreadfully drunk, and as they're a-going to bury me, let them fall down with my trunk. Let there be no fighting nor sobbing, but one single favour I crave. Take me up in my tarpaulin jacket, and fiddle and dance to my grave. It is in such delectable doggerel as this that we must seek for the origin of the land-going idea of the sailor, a libelous idea, whose influence is to be witnessed in the nautical play, ballad, and novel of the current hour. Nevertheless, many of the old sea songs, particularly those in which there is no reference to Grog and to Pretty Suki, are full of a true and stirring spirit. They seem as if jotted down in a moment of inspiration, in the heat of the conflict, when the air was dark with the smoke of battle, and when the cannon's roar rolled in thunder through the gloom. Such is Bold Sawyer, with its brisk opening invitation. Come all ye jolly sailors, with courage stout and bold, Come enter with bold Sawyer, he'll clothe you all in gold. Repair on board the old Nassau, or as fine a ship as e'er you saw, We'll make the French to stand in awe, she is man with British boys. Commodore Keppel, with his good design, commanded the squadron, five sail of the line. The Prince Edward of forty guns, the far drake and furnace bombs, to take gory, it must be done, by true English boys. The twenty-ninth of October, from Spithead we set sail. Kind Neptune conveyed us with a sweet and pleasant gale. So steering on the Barbary shore, distance about ten leagues or more, the wind at west aloud did roar. Stand by, ye British boys. So steering on the lee shore until the break of day, we spied a lofty sail on the Barbary shore to lay. In great distress she seemed to be, her guns all overboard through she, which proved the Litchfield for to be, with all her British boys. The wind blowing hard, we could give them no relief, a stretching on the lee shore we touched at Tenerife. So watering the ships at Santa Cruz, taking good wine for our ships to use, we sold our clothes, good wine to booze, like brave British boys. Our ship being watered and plenty of good wine, we hoisted our topsails and crossed the tropics line. 
the wind at west the leading gale our gallant ship did sweetly sail steady along she ne'er will fail with all her british boys steady a port don't bring her by the lee yonder is the flagstaff of gory i do see we brought the city within fight anchored in gory bay that night cleared our ships ready to fight like brave british boys early the next morning the prince edward of forty guns was stationed off the island to cover our two bombs with all her jovial fighting men the drums did beat to quarters stand like brave british boys we sailed up to the batteries as close as we could lay our guns from the top and poop aloud did play which made the french to cry more blue diable what shall we do here comes bold sawyer and all his crew they're all british boys then followed by the dunkirk and torbay the guns aloud did rattle and the shells aloud did play which made the french their battery shun and from their trenches for to run the flag was struck the fight was done o oh, huzzah my british boys the nassau with dunkirk and torbay of renown three as fine vessels as belong unto the crown the only ships that fought so free in taking of the isle of gory they are all british boys boast not of frenchmen nor yet of maclome sawyer's as big a hero as ever yet was known whilst the shot around him did flee and engaging twice the augury as valiant men as ever you see they are all british boys here's a health to king george our sovereign majesty likewise to bold sawyer that fought the french so free our officers and all our crew are valiant men as e'er you knew so here's a health to all true blue my brave british boys there is a strong healthy pulse too in such a song as the london man of war the fourteenth day of august in plymouth sound we lay on board the common order we could no longer stay as on the coast of ireland our orders did run so it was to cruise but ne'er refuse when we met with our proud foe we had not sailed many leagues before we did espy a lofty sail to the wind would come bearing down so nigh they hailed us in french my boys and asked from whence we came our answer was from liverpool and the london is our name if you're the london man of war as i suppose you be we are the royal delamarque that you shall quickly see tis boys haul up your courses and let your ship lay to your men so stout your boats let out or else we will sink you the first broadside we gave to them we struck them with such wonder their lofty yards and top masts came rattling down like thunder that's very well that's very well our captain he did say that's very well says our commodore we'll show em british play the next broadside we gave to them so hot our shot did fly we shot away their ensign staff and down their colours lie that's very well that's very well our captain he did say come draw your swords and pistols load for we'll board without delay 
So now we've taken the Delamark and safe in Plymouth Sound. But when we do cast anchor, we'll fire our guns all round. Here's a health unto the captain and all such warlike souls. To him let's drink, but never shrink over full flowing bowls. Four, the bold salamander, blow, boreas, blow, and others whose titles it would be idle to quote. I have no space. I doubt whether we shall ever again have sea songs of the old pattern. It is not perhaps that the sentiment of the age is opposed to them, though the old Blackwall and Erith tomfoolery of drink, fiddling, and the like would not perhaps be found very suitable to the tastes of the day. The difficulty lies in the dearth of nautical topics. For my part, I cannot understand what kind of opportunities the naval war of the future is to supply the nautical songwriter with. There is nothing poetical in the armour-clad, nothing inspiring. A ship swelling like a cloud upon the sea, with cabin windows flashing, an admiral in a cocked hat, walking the quarter-gallery, the white hammock line of the vessel's towering defences, dotted with the red coats of marines, the blue surge breaking in sheets of silver against the golden brightness of the metal sheathing, pretty little midshipmen in lace and dirks, strutting the almond white quarter-deck, groups of bronzed and brawny sailors at work, with junks of tobacco standing high under their cheekbones. Here were materials to colour the poet taster's meekest jingle, and to put a free and windy and briny life of their own into the most halting sing-song that ever teased the ear. There were twenty different types of ships to write about, from that cloud-like pyramid, the four-decker, giving tongues of flame and voices of thunder to the meaning and the message of the nation, down to the little cutter that, with stern and fore-chaser only, heightened the brightness of the annals with many a sparkling passage. There were a thousand colours, and all were magical, but marine romance is now as flat as though the machinery with which the iron plate is rolled out had passed over it. What can there be of seamanship for the poet to sing of when the genius of the chase lies in the revolutions of the engines and in an amidship helm? There is no weather gauge now to manoeuvre for. It matters not to a steamer how the wind sits. Jack, when he works his gun, will keep his shirt on, stand inside a metal tower, and let fly at the enemy two leagues distant. His ship is as ugly as the dugong. It is not in poetic art to idealise her. A roaring old sea-song of the type of the saucy Arethusa, or Stand to your guns, my hearts of oak, would ring with but a melancholy note through the iron interior of the armour-clad. Indeed, the extinction of the naval sailing-ship is of necessity the extinction of the naval sea-song as we understand the expression. The poet must go to the merchant service now if he wants marine suggestions. Yet the sailor need not complain. There is a large, old-fashioned literature in marine ballads to choose from, whenever he feels disposed to tune up his pipes, and he will also hold that until the nautical songwriter resolves to quit the mouldy and impure traditions of caricature, the less he says about Jack, the better. End of section 18